Welcome back. This is the Clay Golem. This is Foundry VTT, and this is my mod list. So I've had a few requests for people to go through what my setup is. Um, and a lot of you will be aware of this already. If you followed through the making of Strad, for example, you would have seen what I've used, where I've used it, um, etc. But a few people kind of wanted to see what kind of setup I'm using. Now, what's really important is Every group is different. Every game is different. So do not look at other people's lists and go, that's what I need to have installed. Don't do that. Because <laughs> you'll end up with mods that you don't know how to use or you don't know what they do. Um, and you're, you're just adding more burden to your system and to your players without really understanding how that helps your game. So don't do that. But by all means, be inspired by people who say, but I use this. And of course, we look at a lot of mods on this channel. It, we, God knows how many there are left to go. There's uh, blinging hundreds of them, aren't there? Um, we look at mods on this channel, and every mod that I'm using is a mod we've looked at on this channel. So uh, if you're thinking, oh, okay, that looks good. Why is he using that? You can go back to that playlist of add-ons, and you will be able to find a video where we talk about um, the mod that's on this list here. Because I don't add any mods to my games unless I've looked at it and played with it. Now for me, when I'm looking at it and playing with it, I then turn that into a video for you guys also to understand this is what you could use it for. Um, and we know some of them people go, oh yeah, brilliant, that's gonna change the way I do things. And others, people are sort of like, yeah, don't see the point. And that's exactly what I mean, everybody's is different. So with no further ado, this is my Curse of Strahd setup. So as a reminder, this is very much a, trying to sort of replicate the face-to-face -face tabletop experience. I'm not adding loads of automation on here. I don't want to turn this into a computer game. We're using a mixture of um, battle maps where appropriate, but also more sort of theatre of the mind type of scenes with just images. So you can see here, while I have 80 modules currently installed, uh, for this, active modules in Curse of Strahd, I only have 33. Now, if you're relatively new to Foundry, you might be thinking, 33, blimey, that sounds an awful lot of modules. Um, and if you're a bit more used to Foundry and you're involved in some of the forums and things like that, you'll be thinking, 33, that's not very many at all. <laughs> there are people who run literally hundreds of mods. Um, and that's fine if that's what they want for their game. Mine are quite, especially Curse of Strahd, quite traditional, so I don't need loads. So with no further ado, what I'm actually using? Well, I've broken this into three main categories uh, just to help kind of explain what I'm using and why. Um, so on the left, these are the DM scene tools. These are the tools that I use for creating my scenes um, and for make, setting them up the way I want. I've then, in the middle there, I've got my Game Master, my DM tools for running the game. So things I want installed that make my life easier as the DM to be able to run stuff. Yes, of course, I've set up all the scenes and that translates into um, running the game as well. But those are specific for running the game. And then on the right, I've got all of the mods that I've installed especially for my players so that all about enhancing my players experience so that's how i've broken it down so if we start on the left um a lot of these will be very familiar because we have gone over them and you've seen me using them fx master i like that because it does give me that ability to give more control over things like weather effects and fog uh, how foggy it is and, and things like that which is really important in curse of strad for me uh, item piles i really like item piles you could say that that dumps into dm game tools and player experience as well so a lot of these kind of bridge over there but item piles for me is really useful for things like setting up shops um, which we haven't got in Curse of Strahd at this point um, but also for loot bags and things like that so I like to use that JB2A because it gives me access to so that's the um, uh, that's the uh, the uh, animations i kept wanting to say automations no that's the animations pack i used a free version um, it just gives me access to those and while i haven't used them much in the setup right now i will be and i'll get back to that at the end of this or after this section 
Levels, I rely quite heavily on levels by the Ripper for my maps where we've got things like the Death House. It's on multiple levels, all of my buildings. I like that. I like levels. I'm really glad that that is a thing. Uh, Media Optimizer, again, you really don't need that at all. I like it because it helps me just be a bit more organized. It helps me organize and it keeps my files of a reasonable usable size, uh, especially if I'm using big images that I've generated using AI. They might be huge. All of that needs to be downloaded by my player's machine. So if those files are much bigger than needed, it's just going to add delays. So that makes a huge difference to the quality of play as well as me as the setting up everything keeping me organized. Uh, Monk's Active Tile Triggers, uh, <laughs> if you haven't worked out by now, uh, I'm a big fan. Uh, I use it for lots of stuff. I tend to use it mostly for buttons in Curse of Strahd, creating buttons so that I can create scene effects, lightning and things like that. Um, I'm not sure how I would run my games without uh, without mats. Uh, sequences in there because that allows us to do some stuff with a little bit, little bit of automation animation stuff. I use Tagger as well, just for tagging my tile. So that really goes hand in hand with Monk's Active Tile Triggers for me. Do you need to use Tagger? No, you really don't need to use it at all. Um, I choose to use it because it makes something simpler and because I'm packaging stuff. Um, and we'll come back to that in another video. Um, because I'm packaging stuff, it makes sense to use Tagger because it just makes life easier. Uh, wall Height, which I don't really use wall height for for wall height um, but it's an integral part of using levels so I need to have that in there and the last one on there we've only just looked at of course is world setting sync the new one that's just come out um, from Ripper now again you don't need to have that at all because I set up Curse of Strahd without that um, it's only post setting up that I've then chosen to install that and make that my master uh, template if you like. So they're all the ones I need to set up my scenes. They're all the ones that I've got installed. Is that locked in forever? Absolutely not. Um, so far everything we've created, the whole of the first act, Curse of Strahd is basically in three main acts. The entire of the first act has all been created um, only using those tools. I haven't had to use anything else. But if I find a particular scene or a particular area where I go, hang on a minute, I've got a different challenge here, I might end up adding more mods on that solve that particular problem. But I'm not going to add mods on just for the sake of it. I'm only going to add mods on to solve a problem. All right, so on to the next section right in the middle then, the game tools. So what I use to make my life easier as a DM, um, that hasn't already made my life easier through in the setup stage, such as using Monk's active tile triggers for buttons and stuff. Uh, DDB importer, I think is brilliant. So session zero, creating characters. Um, they will create characters um, in Foundry. Um, but what will happen on the back end is we will talk through and I will do dice rolls and things within Foundry. But in the background, I will be building their character in D&D &D Beyond because it makes sure I don't make mistakes. I don't forget things and they're playing a subclass and it's like I can't remember how that works. It's just going to walk me through that. Now, for higher level characters, yeah, it's not quite so simple, but certainly first, second, third level characters, when you're starting an adventure, Curse of Strahd is starting at first level, that's why I've got the Death House in there. D&D um, &D Beyond is a really good way to build their characters initially, and DDB Importer, I can just pull them directly in. So I can do all that in the background, so I'm talking them through the options, you know, what feet do you want, and things like that. We can do all of that, and while in the background, I'm updating um, the copy of that character in D&D Beyond and then I just pull that character in. Um, at end of session zero they will all have their characters on D&D Beyond. I can either pull them in at that point or after session zero has finished they've all gone away. I can just pull them all through, match it with their artwork and then check everything. So that's a really important point about session zero is not only we're we creating characters, uh, we're creating our images for our characters, our token images. It then gives that DM a opportunity between session zero and session one 
to check everybody's vision is set up correctly? Have they taken a spell that you want to check uh, the automation on if you're using automation? Or you want to check the, because I do have the um, the automated animations in, have I got my spell animation? Is it working? I don't want to set up and spend time setting up and checking every single spell when most of those spells are never going to get used in this game. They're just not. If they, if nobody brings a wizard, I don't need to check all the wizard spells. <laughs> it's just a waste of time, isn't it? I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do it when, as and when they need it. So D&D Porter allows me to complete session zero, pull everything in, check everything is ready to go, and I'm happy with it before then session one happens, everything I've been able to test. Right, next one. Maxwell's Manual of Malicious Maladies. Again, massively optional. Really, really don't need to use it. I like it for the flavor, especially in something like Curse of Strahd. You hit zero hit points, you're walking away with some kind of permanent injury or at least some ongoing uh, negative effect now sometimes that can just be a scar sometimes it could be losing a whole limb i like that extra bit of jeopardy especially in something like curse of strad it's purely a choice um, and having that in as the module is uh, is a really nice way of being able to do that quick and easy i'm not flicking through books and looking up websites and stuff like that uh, monk's token bar so i use monk's token bar so you can see it down at the bottom here um, now because I'm using, and obviously that'll be in the next section, but because I'm using the uh, Argon combat, combat HUD, I have decided to use that for Curse of Strahd for my newer players to support them. Um, Monk's Token Bar, I'm not using the full thing, but what it does allow me to do is it gives me the freezing of movement automation for combat. So combat starts and it sets everybody's movement to... It locks their movement. They cannot move their tokens unless it's their go. So, again, it's just a bit of crowd control, really. It stops some git going, oh, well, I'd rather be the other side of the battlefield and moving themselves when they shouldn't. So as soon as I hit that start combat, they ain't moving anywhere. Um, so I really like that feature of it. Um, and, of course, we've got things like request roll in there, which is a really, really useful shortcut for me as the DM. So that's the main reason why I'm using Monk's Token Bar. I've also got Ownership Viewer, um, mostly for my journals. Um, and again, we've looked at that previously. Really, really useful for me, especially when I've got lots of journal entries that I want to reveal as the party go along. And we've seen that. Um, we've got that linked in with their landing page. Things appear on their landing page that they can then click on and it takes them to their journal. It's a really nice, easy way. If you're not sure what I'm talking about, if I just go to the party journal, it gives me icons here down the side that shows me who can see what. So can, which player can see it, can all players see it, can they write in it, etc. Really just visual, really easy for me to keep control of it. Um, and then the last one I've got in this area is the Spotlight OmniSearch. So we've looked at that really, really recently, and it's like, hell yeah, that's just going to make life easier if I need to pull a warg out from a pocket or, or whatever it might be. It's handy. How often I will actually need it in game? I don't know. But when I do need it, I'm going to be really grateful it's there. Um, so for me, I want that one in. It's just there as a backup. Again, it just makes my life really, really easy. And as we saw when we looked at that one, it's particularly useful because it will search everything, including things like weather effects. So it's very quick for me to be able to adjust things on the fly. It all looks smooth for the players. Uh, and I'm not stressing. <laughs> Where the hell did I put that? <laughs> Where do I find that option again? Um, I can just search really really nice so that's the so that's not a very long list is it so most of mine are about setting up my scenes or about the player experience i've got very few tools for the dm because i the way i've set things up and i'm very traditional and very old <laughs> a very traditional uh, D, D player um so i'm very used to using my voice 
um, and talking through what's happening and explaining stuff, describing smells, rather than relying too much on things like automation and stuff. And I want my players to be describing things as well and participating to the story rather than the machine doing it for them. Okie dokie. Right, so on to player experience then. So these are all the ones that are basically eye candy or make shortcuts for my players so they can focus on that story, focus on the role play, the adventure, the story, rather than focusing on the mechanics. So first off, we've got Argon Combat HUD. Now, obviously, um, we've covered this again recently. Um, I haven't got any players in, so it's not going to uh, show me anything on here. Did I not even bring a single player in here? Yeah, of course I have. Um, I should be able to slap Haley down here. Uh, oh, it's because I'm not in combat. Stupid boy. I've got the setting where... There we go. I have to actually click on her. Um, so the Argon Combat HUD there. Again, we had a bit of debate about this in the comments about pros and cons of it. Um, you know, it, does, it lead the, does it lead players too much to, and restrict them to only what's here um, and stop them thinking about what else there is? Or does it make life easier for them? And there was there's a there's a bit of a split between the community over which is the which is the good way to go. Um, because I've got relatively new players uh, who are still learning, so they're all they're all starting with characters um, that they haven't played before. As in, sorry, as in classes that they haven't played before uh, because they haven't played that much. So this is going to support them. In understanding, oh, that's right. Yes, what have I got in my spell list? I can have a look at that. Ah, uh, yes, I've got my hide, ready, dash. All of these things that come under a main action. It just reminds them of like, oh yeah, I forgot about disengage. Oh yeah, I forgot about I can go full dodge. And they can hover over it just to see what they can do. Um, so from that point of view, I like that as a reminder for newer players, but obviously my job as the DM is to ensure that they understand what their options are when it comes to in combat and stuff. But if they can look at it themselves, it's going to make life easier. So I want that on for my players. Uh, auto rotate I've got on. Now I've got a little Haley down here in the bottom right hand corner um, and she's moving normally. We've looked at that before. My players, because I'm using these types, she's very tiny down here, isn't she? Hello, sweetheart. Um, because I'm using um, these type of portraits for characters, they are not going to turn uh, and swivel around. But my monsters that I want, my wolves, etc., um, those are top down tokens, and I do have them rotate. So I wanted auto rotate on for that because I want players to be thinking a little bit tactically. And regardless of work, rules as written, um, if I've got a rogue who is got their bow out and they're shooting at that goblin and they're directly behind it and they say, oh, can I have advantage? I don't really care what the rules say. I'm going to say yes. It's directly behind them. They might be aware of you, but they got their back to you. They're not going to be dodging you um, in the same kind of way. It just gives that kind of, you know, the idea the players will use the space better in the battle map. They will manoeuvre and not just stand there in a shield wall and slug it out. Uh, that's the idea. But every player is different. Every character is different. Every game is different. All right, next one. Automated animations. That's just eye candy. It's purely eye candy. You cast a spell, there's a little animation. You swing your sword, there's a little animation. 100% um, not required. Really not. Uh, it's just nice though. Yeah, let's give let's give them that. So I've decided to include that. Uh, and I think for my players, particularly the spell casting, it gives a nice little uh, a nice little boost for them. It's like, oh yeah, brilliant. And what I'm going to do is again, once I've got all their characters in, once I know what their um uh what kind of spells and things that they've got i will be going through my automated animations i'll be checking each of those spells work exactly but i will be asking those questions of the player so you're playing a sorcerer okay tell me what your spells look like you know because i don't care if a sorcerer says hey look can i instead of all my spells being fire can i make them all ice sure 
you can do that. I don't mind. I really don't mind. So that Scorching Ray becomes a Freezing Ray. does exactly the same amount of damage, but instead of doing um, burning damage, it's going to do freezing damage. I have no problem with that whatsoever. Um, I think it adds flavour. It gives players more options to how they want to build their character. They can theme them. You know, Fire Wizards. Yeah, great. You know, we've seen a million of them, haven't we? <laughs> You want to change it to something else? You change it to something else. I'm happy with that. It encourages them to think about their character a bit more. So I'm going to go through all those spells, look at automated animations, and go, well, hang on a minute. I need to change this wizard Scorching Ray, and I need to find an ice version of it. So when that sorcerer casts their spell, they get their animation that's correct. So I think that's a really nice touch. It helps buy into that character. I've also got the automated conditions in here for 5e, because this is D&D. Um, now, this is the one we game. We looked at this, so you can go back and look at that video. Um, it, it integrates in with full automation, like MIDI QOL, which I'm not using. So why am I using it? The reason I'm using it is because it's really useful for when, and again, go back and look at that video, if a player has a condition on them, it will prompt them for their dice roll of whether it should be at advantage normal or disadvantage uh, and that i think is really really good um, that's really helpful again especially for not even just for newer players for any player it's not going to do it for them but what it's going to say is hey by the way this probably you've got advantage here oh yeah i've got advantage right and they can check that with the dm or otherwise they miss out on that um, and again, it, it removes some of the workload for me as a DM, having to think about advantage, disadvantage for every single dice roll. Because <laughs> that can be burdensome, can't it, when a combat gets chaotic? I've got seven players in Curse of Strahd. That becomes quite a handful if I'm not careful. So automated conditions really going to help with that. Uh, the Carousel Combat Tracker, we've seen that. I love that. Uh, it's another Ripper one, of course. Of course it is. It's beautiful. It gives a nice visual show for the players of whose turn it is they can see what kind what you know what the monsters are they can see who's going next it just shows it nice and easy and obviously from a dm's point of view it helps me control combat they can see oh blimey hang on a minute my goes next i don't need to be thinking about what i want to do um i really like that i think it's a good visual for the players uh, without adding automation it's not automating anything it's just visually showing what's going on uh, combat booster so i have got combat booster in as well um, which does a few things for us um, again you can go look at that video it's just a really nice thing that we can uh, we can use to add onto our game just to give us a few extra little bits of um, you know a little little bits of look and feel that make life a bit nicer um dice so nice i've written disc so nice there haven't i want a map it <laughs> uh dice so nice again uh, you know we're rolling dice are we and we're just doing let's do one we do uh, roll one d 20 now yeah it's because i can't type we've just established that there we go i mean how boring is just the card when they're rolling dice i want those dice on there I think it's a no-brainer, um, and uh, it, it should be integral core part of Foundry. It really should. Um, is rolling of dice. I mean, it's a dice-based game. Um, <laughs> yeah, wouldn't run a game without it. Um, now, to add to that, I've also got the epic rolls in. Now, again, how often will I use the epic rolls? Probably not very often. Use it sparingly is kind of my rule to myself. However, there will be times when, I don't know, player decides to do something that is very much do or die. Um, you know, well, I'm going to try to leap from the parapet and grab hold of the, you know, of, of the griffin as it flies past. It's like, really? Really? Okay, that's an epic roll, because this is either going to go spectacularly, heroically well, or you're going to plunge to the floor and take significant damage, possibly killing yourself. That's an epic roll. So having it in there, ready to go, I may use it, I may not use it, I probably will use it occasionally. I would like to think I don't use it more than once per session-ish. Ish. Depends how crazy my characters are, of course. <laughs> 
All right, so yeah, Epic Rolls just adds that drama. Hover Distance, I like Hover Distance, especially for those ranged ones, uh, for those ranged players, um, you know, so they know whether, again, how far that is. Uh, and I do believe that that also, Hover Distance also works with automated conditions. I think that actually also will tell them about whether they've got advantage, disadvantage, based on um, on the range to target for bows and things. I think that's part of automated conditions, not Hover Distance. Um Lordu's custom dice. Um, you don't need this at all. This is a this is just a pack that adds on to dice so nice. Uh, that particular dice we just saw me roll. That one. This particular dice comes from that pack. I wanted that for Curse of Strahd. I like that particular one. That kind of dark gothic-y red um, dice. So that's the only reason why I've got that installed is purely for that dice pack. Again, you don't need it. There's plenty of customization you can do with Dice So Nice. Right, moving on. Smart Target. Again, another one we've looked at relatively recently. Uh, it, it just makes, again, it makes life a little bit easier for the players just when they're selecting their target. So, um, you know, it, every time it comes to their turn, they're going to be able to select their targets just by clicking on what they want to attack. Uh, it just makes it a little bit smoother for them, a little bit easier doesn't change the fundamental game uh, most of these don't change the fundamental game they're just supports their hints their eye candy uh, and splatter another eye candy of course um, just for when we're taking serious damage we're going to get some blood splats when things die we're going to leave trails of blood if we're seriously injured um, just a little visual effect just to kind of like hang on a minute well that one's bleeding everywhere as it runs away just adds a little bit of extra um, doesn't need to go mad don't need it but it's nice uh, and the last one is torch and it's just this uh, on we've got Haley's got it here it's just this shortcut on actually selecting your light source um, you can't see it because we've got global illumination on it's not dark here um, but it's just this ability to kind of turn on and turn off their own torches and things like that from their backpack it's just a shortcut it's just easier it makes my life easier I haven't got to go oh hang on a minute let me change your you know the light settings on your on your token uh, they can just do it that way so there's again that that helps the dm that's kind of a dm game tool but it gives that control to those players um and yes if they do decide to wander into that dark area with that torch on um the monsters will spot them and then they'll go oh no i haven't got my torch lit it's like yeah you have you didn't put it out it's on and we can see quite clearly it's on so it's a nice way of doing that because that's always been a bit of a challenge in face-to-face -face games the old pen, pen and paper job is occasionally players will say oh no 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 i didn't do that you didn't you <laughs> oh no no i put my torch out before we came in did you though <laughs> and then you just kind of have to do that balance of hang on a minute do you do you let them get away with it even though you know that they're uh cheating is a bit of a strong word um but yeah you're gonna let them get away with it or are you hard and fast and mean with it well this makes a life a little bit easier from that point of view right i've rambled on loads so again this is my setup what i'm using for curse of strad it is not locked down um and as we work through Curse of Strahd, I might find I need an extra tool for setting up particular areas of scenes. I might decide that there's another mod I want to add just to make things flow a bit better from my point of view as the DM. And player experience, I might kind of go, do you know what, we're just not using something. Or they don't like, I don't know, they don't like the Argon Combat HUD. They'll get rid of it. <laughs> you know, so I'm not locked into having this is it. I can't take any off. I can't put any extra on. I'm trying to give without overwhelming my players, some of which are completely new to Foundry, uh, without overwhelming them, I want to give them a good experience, a straightforward experience where they haven't got too many technical things to worry about. Carry on telling the story, playing the game and having fun. Because if they feel like they've got to learn a whole new system and everything else, those first few sessions are going to be you no know, one. They're going to be a bit bogged down. So that brings me back to another way, another another 
quick point I wanted to make about the way that I've chose to set up Curse of Strahd, not just with the modules, but the flow of the adventure. So I've already talked about the importance of that session zero and buying myself space to make sure all of these things, especially the automated animations, um, token vision, uh, all of those things are set up correctly because I don't want to encounter those problems in session one. I want them just to get on with it. Um, but also, one of the reasons I wanted to start them at first level and include the death house is so that they've got time to orient them themselves within Foundry, within the way it works, with the combat system um, and all of that before they get into the meat of the um, Curse of Strahd campaign, which really essentially starts once they get to the village of Barovia. That's where they start picking those bits up. Yes, there's lots of links to the upcoming story through the Death House, um, but that Death House really does serve as a... It's the tutorial area, isn't it? That's what it is. It's the tutorial area. You've got to work your way through the death house. Congratulations, you've passed the tutorial. And on your way through that, you're going to gain that first level or two to prepare you for the proper Curse of Strahd. So it's setting the theme. It's setting the. It's getting the players used to Foundry. It's getting them used to the mechanics within Foundry. And settling into their own characters as well. So once they come out the death house, they're ready to rock on with the actual core adventure. They've got a good idea of the setting. They've got a good idea of their character and their personality. Um, they've got a good idea of how Foundry works. And hopefully it will all come together. Now, for those of you who've been DMing a long time, you will know there will always be one player who just won't ever get it. <laughs> and will need a lot of support uh, and a lot of feedback from the DM and a lot of prompting. Yeah, most groups have that one person. It's really difficult when you've got a whole group like that, which I thankfully I don't get. Um, but you've also got others that are trying to push things forward, perhaps a bit quicker, and that's part of our challenge, isn't it? So I hope this has been interesting or possibly useful. Again, right back to the beginning, that bit of advice of do not go, oh, well, these are the ones I'm going to import. Um, this is, these are what I'm going to put in mine. Don't do that. By all means, be inspired and kind of go, oh, yeah, I hadn't thought of that. Yeah, that's a really good way of doing it. Great. If you're, if you're thinking, yeah, well, I'm going to use that as well, make sure you understand what that mod's actually doing for you. Because if it's not helping, don't use it. Get rid of it. Bin it. You know, and I've put lots of different mods into Curse of Strahd as I've gone along, and then I've stripped them out. So in some cases, it's a case of I found a, bot a better mod. So I've settled on auto rotate, but we also looked at about face, and I had that in here originally. No point in having both of them. That's stupid. They both do similar things, just in different ways. Get rid of the one you don't want. Yeah. Um, I also had the tactical grid in. Tactical grid, that's absolutely brilliant. I thought, like, oh yeah, I've got to use that. And then I realised that that isn't adding anything for this game. There will be other ones I will use it for, but for this one it's not going to add anything. So, bin it. Get rid of it. Don't need it. All right. So that's it. End of ramble. Um, if you guys have your favourite modules, either ones that I'm using or ones that I'm not using, that you think actually this is what I use, especially those player experience ones. I think those are probably the most important modules. Um, yes, DM support, really important, but the player experience. What's your favourite? What's your favourite module that you have? In fact, you can do it like this, can't you? What's your favourite? favorite module one module if you can pick one <laughs> i don't think i can that you use for creating your game worlds your favorite module for supporting you as the dm and your favorite module that you have that enhances player experience and of course you're allowed to say midi qol if if that is how you run your games all right that's it we're gonna shut up Thank you for watching. I really, really appreciate it. Uh, we're pushing, we're very nearly at 900 subscribers already. There will be an upcoming um, little competition for when we hit the th thousand subscribers mark. So keep an eye out for that over the next couple of weeks. I think I'll probably do that when we hit about 950 and just put that out there for people. Um, but that's it. This video is done and I will see you in the next one. Take care.